Welcome to Bayside. If you're new, a special welcome to you. My name is Mark. Uh, I'm one of the pastors around here. Really good to have you. If you have a Bible, Acts chapter 2, we are in this series called Unstoppable, and we are just going chapter by chapter through the entire book of Acts. And if you have your bulletin, pull out your notes. You got the text there, whole bunch of room to write notes. We are going to jump into this. So, um, the beginning of a new world, the launching of a new world. This is one of the great sermons ever preached in the history of time and certainly in the book of Acts. It opens, here's Peter. So here's what happened. He starts to preach the sermon on the day of Pentecost. It's the first sermon in the book of Acts. And throughout Acts, we are going to see 19 different sermons. About 25% of the book of Acts is Peter and Paul and all these guys preaching sermons and articulating the gospel to the world around them. And we're gonna see how it connects to us in our life as we go. Really is amazing. The book of Acts is this great movement of God, upheaval of the world, upheaval of your own life. And Peter starts it and he he stands up with the 11 and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd. So right there, if we're taking notes on the kinds of things we need to do to reach our family, our friends, our world for Jesus, we got to take a few principles from Peter. And the first one is he actually addresses the crowd. He talks. He articulates out the message of God for them versus just not saying anything. So one of the things that we tend to do, you've heard that old phrase, you know, always preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. <laughs> All right. That's not a thing. You actually have to use words because your your, your friends are never going to figure out that they are sinners separated from God and that the only way to get back connected to them is that by repenting and believing in in the person and the work of Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life in their place, died on the cross from their sin, rose again for their salvation, will give them the spirit if they repent and believe. They're never going to figure that out by you making them cookies. Right? And, and, and just cutting their grass for 20 years and going, boy, I hope my friend asks me why I'm such a good guy one day. Because that's what some of, that's some of your evangelism strategy is like. If I'm just a good person and I post Bible verses on Facebook, someone's going to go, why are you so good? Well, let me tell you, Tommy, that's not what's going to happen. Sometimes you got to address. you got to talk. So, uh... When I was 18 years old and Chris Watt walked into my woodworking class and told me about Jesus, he said, Mark, you are far from God and need to believe in Jesus. The wrath of God needs to be moved over to Jesus in your place. He is your substitute and you need to give your life to Christ right now. And I pray to receive Christ. He didn't just hope that I asked that question someday. He had to articulate that out for me using words and explaining it because that's where uh, most of the power comes from. And this is why, uh, so back in World War II, uh, some of you know Winston Churchill, he was a great orator and he would do these speeches and he went into parliament. And at that time in World War II, the British were losing a lot of people to the Nazis, a lot of money, and you guys, y'all weren't helping, all right? It was us, (laughs) the Canadians and the British were fighting the Nazis for a long time. You guys were like, we're not gonna get involved over there, all right? So he had to convince his parliament to keep going. And he got up in that moment and he did that famous speech. We will fight them on the oceans. We will fight them on the beaches. We, this is my Churchill impression. We will, we will never give up. We will never, we will fight them in the air. We will, we will never give up. And by the end of that speech, the parliament was on their feet saying, let's go and fight the Nazis. And one of the parliamentary guys looked at the other one in a famous word. He goes, how did he just do that? And the guy said, he took the English language and he sent it into battle. That is what your words do every day. You articulate in moments the gospel, which is a spiritual battle for every person around you, and you're either projecting them toward God or away from God. Your words are the battle, and every day you're in it and swaying people. And so do you use your words to build up or tear down? That's the question, because your words are powerful. So this is Peter, and he's addressing the crowd because he knows that this sermon These words that I'm about to say to you, Peter's saying, are going to sway and move your life. And so he says this. He addresses the crowd, and he says, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. So why does he say that? 
Because in chapter 2, verse 1 to 13, they were all in a room, and the Spirit of God fell on them like tongues of fire, fell on these people, and they all started speaking languages that every person would understand, but the other people couldn't understand it. It was this miracle called glossolalia, where all of these different nations were gathered, and all of a sudden, they could hear the gospel in their own language from a bunch of guys who didn't speak those languages. So let me give you an example of this. I want everybody in this moment to just do, do this. Go, la, 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 out loud, go. Keep going. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, stop. Shut up. So, so here's, so, so picture that's what people hear when someone is speaking another language and you don't know what it is. That's what it sounded like. And all of a sudden, it went from, hi, my name is Mark, and I'm a pastor here, and I want to tell you about Jesus. Would you open your, and all of a sudden, they could hear it. In their own language, this is the first miracle that God does in the church by the way of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, they, it's the reverse of what happened in the Tower of Babel. Remember that story in Genesis 11? Humankind wants to build its way up to God. So God confuses their languages and spreads them all out over the world and doesn't want them to talk to each other because they're going to try to become me. This is a reversal. Pentecost is the moment where everybody's languages come back together and he brings a unification. He goes, I want to tell you about Jesus. This is a beautiful, so this is what, this moment happened and everyone who's listening to this, they're like, why are all these guys, this is a weird miracle, these guys are hammered. That's their first explanation. And so Peter goes, guys, no, no, no. And here's the best explanation in the Bible. It's only nine in the morning. The time for drinking is 9 p.m., not 9 a.m. That's Peter's logic. It's only nine. These guys aren't drunk. Don't you understand? And so he says, guys, this miracle happened, this beautiful miracle. And so what is the actual miracle itself? Here's what I love about it. First, he starts to talk to them about something that they're interested in. That's principle number two. You got you to gotta meet people where they're at. He's addressing a question that they have. Are these guys drunk? And he doesn't just jump into theology. He says, let me address the drunken question first. Let me address your actual question, not just stuff I'm interested in. I want to meet you where you are. I want to talk to you. So if your neighbor, and, and, and there's bad examples of this. Like I, I'm constantly, like I was, a, I was a junior high pastor for like three years in this inner city church in Toronto. Right? Just like a bunch of kind of poor inner city gangster kids. And I would go in and be like, let's have an all-nighter, kiddos. Kid got stabbed on his way. And then I'd play. I'd be like, all right, let's listen to great music. And I'd put on Coldplay, all right? And it was all yellow. And, and these kids are like, this sucks, man. What do you, come on, put on some good stuff. I'm like, right. And, and there's these moments where, like, we don't meet people where they're at. It's like the, I, I told you about the first time I ever preached in the church that, that I was preaching at. They had this rule that every sermon needed to start with a joke. And it was like, I'm like, why? It's not my style. They're like, well, it will be your style. This is what we do here. I'm like, what do you mean like a joke? I don't tell jokes. And they're like, yeah, you got to like look it up, some joke. And then because it eases the crowd into it. I'm like, all right. For the first time I preach, I'm like, two Jews and a hooker walk into a bar. <laughs> and then later they're like, you know what? Don't, don't worry about the jokes anymore. You're good. <laughs> don't worry. And so... That's me not meeting the people where they're at, all right? Just totally misread that situation. We do it all the time. And so here's Peter, and he's going, let me actually start where you're at. Let me ask, so when your neighbor is thinking about Jesus, if they want to talk about the historical Jesus or evil and suffering or heaven and hell, don't just skip over to stuff you want to talk about. Meet them where they're at. Here's the other third, third um, principle in this is Peter is doing something that I find fascinating. And this is good for each of us in this room. He's not letting them be distracted by talking about wine. And what I mean by that is like every single one of us has the temptation in our life to sit around and talk about worldly nonsense to distract ourselves from the deeper questions of our souls. And so they're talking about, let's get drunk. What kind? Now think about what you do with your time. How many of you waste your time talking about wine versus eternal things? How many of us waste our time 
Think about how you interact with people, the pie chart of the hours of your day and the words that you say. How many of them are extended out talking about the weather, politics, whether you're building a new kitchen, what kind of car you want, all of this temporal, distracting stuff. Do you like Cab or Merlot? I don't know, Tommy. Listen, if you're going to do that for 80 years, it's a waste of your time. Because at some point, you got to talk about God stuff. Hey, I can't believe Biden did this. I can't believe Trump did that. <laughs> Guys, there's eternal things at stake. The weather, there's nothing to talk about. You live in Sacramento. It's just sunny and sometimes there's a little bit of rain. That's it. You've been talking about the weather to your neighbor for five years. Well, I can't believe the sunny today, Tom. Yeah, Joey. Ah, moving on. What? At some point, you got to go, hey, Tom, how's your soul, man? Because we've been talking about the, we, 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 this is, what are you doing with the 76 years you've got on this planet and the distractions that will come into your life? Because here's the principle, guys. Important things like politics and the weather and, 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 and the mortgage rates. Oh, I hope the mortgage rates go down. Me too. I think the Fed's going to. Listen, guys. <laughs> there are important things to talk about. But sometimes, listen to this, important things can distract you from most important things. This is why. When Jesus is teaching in that synagogue or in that house, in Peter's house, and nobody can get in, and they send the paralyzed man down through the roof. Remember that story? And what happens when he gets there? Here's a paralyzed man. He can't move. His friends help him come down. Jesus walks up to him, and what does he do? What does he say to him when he walks up to him? What does he say? Your sins are forgiven you. Fascinating. Not why he came. This guy wants to walk. And Jesus is like, oh, I'm going to solve a problem in your life that you don't even know you have yet. The eternal question. I want to solve your 80 billion years, not just talk about the 80 that you have on this planet. I want to talk about eternal things, not just temporal things. Because I could heal your paralyzedness. But you're going to die at some point. And if I don't heal your sin, that's what trouble you're in. Eternal trouble versus temporal trouble. So this is what he, Peter's doing. So he goes, okay, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain. These guys aren't drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Here's the explanation. No, no, no. Listen, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he begins to explain why all these tongues happened. And he starts it out with a great principle for your life, and it's this. He starts it out by talking about the Bible. He quotes the prophet Joel to explain this super important moment. I will say this to you. Your life needs to be built on the scriptures. Not, not the opinion of your friends, not the Instagram reel, not your TikTok, not the website, not sermons. The scriptures, Peter's going, I have something really important to explain to you, and I want to talk about the Bible. That's why we as a church, we're a Bible church. We literally are going through the book of Acts, paragraph by paragraph, because we know it's the only hope for your life. Have you ever woken up and gone, man, I wish if God exists, I wish he would just tell us what he thinks about stuff. <laughs> That's what this is. That's what the Bible is. It's God saying, it's the word of God to you. Saying, here's what I think about your money and, and sex and how to use your body and how to do work and how to do family. It's all in here and I'm gonna explain it to you. It's beautiful because it has the power to change your life. When I was planting a church in 2010 up in Vancouver, everyone told me Canadians are not gonna care about the Bible. You can't just get up and preach the Bible. You got to entertain everybody. You got to woo everybody. Hey, everybody, come. Da, da. And I said, okay, I'm going to do a, a case study in whether this is serious. And so I just preached. The, I just literally opened my, the, the, one of the launch series of our church was a three and a half year series through the gospel of Matthew. All right. That's what it was. It was just Matthew, go, 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 go for three and a half years. Our graphics team loved it. It was one logo for three and a half years. 
And then they just kicked their feet up and waited for the next series to start. And in that time, this thing that was not supposed to work, 700 people got baptized. And not just showed up at the church, a lot more people than that got baptized. Now we're talking progressive post-Christian Canada got baptized just by us talking about the Bible because the Bible works. It has the power to change your life. And what happened was I would just preach the Bible and then their marriages would get healed and their addictions would be, they'd be set free from them and they'd figure out how to be a man and, and lead their family well and how to be a wife and how to be a kid and how to be a student. And all of these lives started getting changed, not because of me. And here's the thing. When your doctor looks you in the face and gives you that cancer diagnosis, here's what you're going to need. The scriptures, not a sermon. You're not going to need me on a podcast when your life falls apart and the floor falls out from under you. You're going to need this because this is what is going to put steel in your spine and define reality for you when you start to question what reality really is. The Bible will speak to you. And here's the great thing about the Bible. It never agrees with you. And that's good because you are so messed up and wicked. You are, you're so narcissistic and turned in on yourself. You just want to believe a bunch of stuff about the world. And the Bible will never let you if you let it. It will always go none of like, And that's the beautiful part about it. Let me illustrate this this way. And I almost hesitate because I'm going to lose half of you after I say it. But so be it. So... So I'm at this Super Bowl party when the Super Bowl was on and the whole group of people wanted to do a little bet to make the game interesting. So all of them, okay, let's do a little bet. I said, okay, that's cool. Let's make the game interesting. And of course, the whole, everybody goes in and now I'm not a sports guy. So I went and did the one thing nobody else in the room did, which means I won. I was the only winner in the room. Everyone else lost. Why? Because I bet against the 49ers. Right? This is what I'm saying. This is why I'm going to lose you. All right? Listen. Listen. And uh, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because I'm not a sports guy. So I went and moneyballed the situation out, and I looked at the data. And the data said, you're not going to beat Mahomes in the fourth quarter in a tight situation. This is going to be a tight game. I have to bet against the 49ers. And the whole room hated me when right at the end I got up and went, yay! (laughs) Now, here's the problem. None of you won on your bet on the Super Bowl because you couldn't bring your heart to bet against a team that you emotionally wanted to win, and that's your problem. You can't just look at the data and follow it. You always follow your emotions, even when your emotions lead you astray, even when your emotions mean you're a loser, like all of y'all, all all right? (laughs) See, that's the wicked part about all of us. We can't go against what our hearts say. And here's what the Bible does. It pushes back up against you and says, I don't care what you think. All of your emotional energy being expended to convince you to live like this, act like this, think like this. And this is the book that's going to push back against you and say, no, 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 no. I had a woman come up to me last uh, couple weeks ago. I was preaching up at our Auburn campus. Awesome lady walks up. She's like, listen, I got divorced a couple years ago and I want to start sleeping with the guy that I'm dating. And I did, you know, I was a young adult pastor for six years, so I've had this conversation a lot. And it's like, I'm just wondering, where in the Bible does it say that I can't sleep with them if I don't marry them? And I'm like, well, it's pretty clear. She's like, no, no, I, like, what's the verse? I'm like, all the verses. And so I had to go through with her from Genesis 1. God says, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That is now the paradigmatic category of all sexual relationship from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 all the way to Revelation 22. And anything else other than a man and a woman in the context of marriage, leaving their mother and father and doing that, is what the rest of the Bible calls sexual immorality. So all those phrases when you read sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God, the sexual immoral, it's anybody doing sex outside of this context of Genesis chapter 1. And she went, "Mm, shucks! And she walked away disappointed. Why? Because in that moment, the Bible was pushing up against what she wanted. And that's the beauty of it. That's why Peter's going, be very careful to base your life on how you feel. And so he says, I'm going to talk to you, but I'm going to talk to you from the Bible. I'm going to explain some stuff from the Bible. So he quotes the prophet Joel, which was written 2,000 years before this event actually took place. And here's what he says. In the last days, this is a quote 
from Joel chapter 2. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my what? My spirit. So again, he's explaining this event that happened where these tongues showed up. And now he's like, guys, this is a fulfillment of this Joel passage written 2,000 years ago where he looked into the future and he said, there's going to come a time when God's very spirit will go inside of people, which is crazy because the, you know that the story of the Bible is the story of the presence of God. In the garden, God walked with them in the cool of the day. And then that was lost. And so he shows up to Moses and he says, I'm going to be with you through the Red Sea with a, a pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. And then he says, build a tabernacle. And then the tabernacle, he says, build a temple. And then the temple gives way to Jesus and he shows up. Then Jesus leaves and he sends us his spirit. This is the first time in history where God's spirit is actually in people. And so uh, Thomas Goodwin, who's a 16th century the theologian, he talks about the idea that we romanticize being in middle, uh, mid, the middle, I was going to say middle earth, the middle east <laughs> with Jesus 2,000 years ago, walking around, there's Aragorn, all right, going through, going into the middle east and we can see Jesus and we can, he's got his hair and his smell and if he sees me, I can touch him and we romanticize what that is. But he leaves. And then Goodwin says, we get one better, which is not Christ external. We get Christ in us, the hope of glory, right? His spirit actually comes inside of you, changing not what you do, but what you want to do. Changing the things that actually give you pleasure. Changing your affections. And this is what God is saying. I got a solution to your lust problem, fellas. It's not just me on the, just telling you don't lust after women. Don't lust after women. Women, don't lust after men who have lots of money. <laughs> it's I'm going to actually give you the tool to defeat those things. I'm not just going to tell you what to do. I'm going to equip you. I'm going to show up in my spirit and do it. This is like in the last days, he says, there, there's now this moment. It's like, it's like all of history has been, Joel was thinking this. There's sin and there's injustice and there's terribleness. But one day, God is going to send his spirit and deal with this. this is what he, it's, like, it's like those vacations. I remember we took a vacation during COVID, which was crazy. In Canada, you had to do all these things. I don't know if you guys traveled a bunch during COVID, but it was like really tough to get anywhere. And there was a lot of nonsense before you took the trip. And so there was this test and that swab and this certificate and this. And you had to constantly be doing, here's $200 to your swab company. And then group, group, my kids would be like, ah, they touched my brain. And like, shut up, right? And so there was all the complication of this and travel and this and swab and that and money and da, da, da. And then finally we got to our destination and I went and I sat down and I opened my book. And it was like, oh, I'm here. That's what Joel is looking forward to. He's going, man, the world is a mess. It's filled with sin and exile and injustice. But one day, God is going to show up and do something so amazing, so beautiful. A new world will be born. Sin will be dealt with. Exile will be over. Racism will, 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 will be over because people are going to see by the power of the Spirit that all this, all this is now gone. There's going to be a great day in the last days. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be amazing. And this is what Peter is getting up and he's saying, it's finally here. What's funny about this phrase right here, because some of you are like, you're a little distracted by this right now. You're like, wait a minute, what? Last days. Some of you grew up in that 90s church setting where last days meant like the end times. Wee! Wee! The airplanes, people be doing surgery, will disappear and bleed out. When I first became a Christian, my buddy Rob brought me over to his mom's house and she had this stack of VHS videos and that's what all of them were. It was a guy looking going, don't you know it's the last days, it's the end times. And it was the 80s, so it was like, I'm Ronald Reagan is the mark of the beast and computers and me and Russia did this and China, it's the end times. It's the end times. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I read Peter's sermon and I went, you know what? That guy's right. It is the end times. And it's been for 2,000 years. It's the last days. It's the end times. 
And it's been for 2,000 years, this, this category called the end. The, the, there was the present age and there was the age to come to a Jew. And what Peter is saying, my goodness, all of these things that we thought were going to happen at the end of time have been ushered into the middle of time. That you and I have been given this spirit that will animate us. That God was going to send on the dry bones in Ezekiel 36 and 37. And this bone army was going to become an army of flesh. And the spirit of God was going to be poured out on them. And Peter's going, that's now. And for some of you, you just need to hear that and go, man, more has actually happened in the person and the work of Jesus than I thought, than I gave credit to. Because God has sent his spirit. And what's beautiful about that, it's almost like, I was thinking about the image of electricity yesterday. In the mid-1800s, electricity was invented or discovered, a way to take it and use it. But before that, it's just all candles and, and flames. But now we have electricity. Everything we do is built on electricity. This is God going, I'm going to send electricity. I'm going to send the spirit, not just tell you what to do. I'm going to actually empower you and ignite you to do what I'm asking you to do. And the question becomes, have you received it? And he says, when the spirit gets poured out on all these people, then he says this. I love this. Uh, he says, first, a bunch of categories. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. The young God goes, I'm going to do something where the young, how many of you are, are young and you're like, ah, God can never use me. He just said, no, 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 the little kiddos, I'm going to do crazy stuff with little kids. See, some of you are like, like I talk to leaders and they go, man, I, I don't think they're ready to lead yet. They're only 35. Let's give them a few more years. I'm like, 35? No, good thing no one told Jesus that you can't accomplish anything before you're 35. <laughs> Sons and daughters, these are, the revel these, are the, these are the leaders, these are the people who get stuff done, the young people with that spirit who go, I can change the world, right? It's a good thing. Listen, I am so happy that a man named Paul Johnson came into my life when I was a 27-year-old kid and looked at me across the room. I had felt a call by God privately about a year earlier to plant a church, but I knew I wasn't going to leave the church I was at. But God had told me, I had told nobody, he said, you're going to plant a church. This guy, Paul Johnson, comes in for an interview to lead the church that I was working at as a young adult pastor, comes in the interview room with 30 people, and they said, what's your vision? And he goes, I'd love to plant churches. And he goes, really? Yeah. And what would that look like? And he points across the room at me and goes, like, why wouldn't we plant a church with that guy? And the people in the room were like, well, I'll give you a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and then he put me on the stage at 28 and said, whoever wants to go with him, he's moving 30 minutes up the road, go ahead with him. I am glad that someone trusted me at 28 years old. The first sermon I ever preached was a pastor. He looked at me when I was 20 years old. And he's like, I want you to preach at youth group tonight. And I'm like, all right, sounds good. <laughs> True story, man. I wasn't ready. Some of you, you're like, yeah, I got to get my life all figured out and perfect. No, God, God, he's going, I'm going to use, I'm going to use little, I'm going to use young people, people who aren't ready yet. People who, don't, you know why he uses young, you know why most revolutionaries are young? Why they're more willing to die than the old? Because they don't have mortgages yet. <laughs> they have nothing to defend. They don't care. They will do anything. That's why they revolt against the powers that be and the rest of us don't want that revolution. We don't want to hear those new voices because we have too much power to lose because we're the ones in power. We got mortgages to pay off. We got things to get done. We have too much that can be compromised. So get, get this young, this, this is what happens in every revolution. It's young people that rise up and go, let's change the way we do things. And God goes, that's exactly who I'm going to use. And then he says, so he goes three categories of people that back then and today were marginalized and had no power. Little kiddos that were just seen as like, oh, you're useless. You just suck resources and you don't do anything. And God goes, no, I'll do something with them. They're the ones who are going to. And then, and then daughters will prophesy. <laughs> Women will do stuff. <laughs> wow, that is very, people are scared now. They're like, amen. 
not amen? Daughters, some of you ladies, God is saying, I want you to do stuff. Don't be afraid. I want to use you to prophesy, to do amazing things. I got three daughters. It's a good thing that them just being girls doesn't disqualify them from doing ministry. 17, 15, and 13, and God goes, I want to use you. And they, they lead worship, and they tell their friends about Jesus. Because God is going, whatever used to hold you back from influence and impact is gone. Because it's a new era. A new world has birthed. The old world is gone. And Peter's going, it's a new day. Young kiddos will do amazing things. Women will do amazing things. And then he says, your young men, instead of just sitting around with no vision in their life, with nothing to die for, he goes, no, no, you young men, you're going to do something amazing. I want to use you. And then he says, what are they going to do? They're going to see visions. And then your old men, I love this. Anybody over 50? Old people. He goes, I'm not done with you. You will dream dreams. Some of you, you're like, man, that's, that, you know, that's a young person's game, doing ministry. And God's going, no, 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 no. You never get to retire from ministry in the kingdom of God. We need you, 65 plus, 70, 80. We need you. We don't need you to retire and move to Phoenix. We need you as a guard and an elder at the gate, pouring into the younger generation, showing them what it means to love Jesus, serve Jesus, sacrifice everything. There's no retirement in the kingdom. You retire when you die, and you die with your boots on. That's what he's saying. We need you older people. You, we need you to rise up. We need you to show us what to do. There's a reason, even as a young kid, I never wanted to hang out with people my own age. At 25, I made the decision, I don't want to hang out with people my own age because they're dumb and they're making all the same decisions as me and they're sitting up playing Halo till two o'clock in the morning hoping to marry a good girl with a nice job. Losers. <laughs> so I said, I'm not going to hang out with people like you. I'm going to hang out with people older than me because they've already made the mistakes, they know the successes, and they know how to win. And I want to try to follow the way that they live their life. We're looking at you guys and we're saying, we need you. We need your time. We need your money. We need your money. We do. If we're going to fund ministry to reach these other generations, to plant churches, we, we got 900 kids down in my two oldest daughters, their lives down here in Sacramento, they were lost a little bit for the first year they were here. They went down to Mexicali, and their lives were changed. And immediately they got friends, found ministry, and settled in here. That's because we raise money from you to send them. Because to send 900 people to do service projects in Mexico costs money. That's why you need to give. You need to be generous. Some of you, you're not generous enough. You're just holding back. And God's going, if we're going to do a movement like the book of Acts, we need to fund it. And that's in the pockets mostly Definitely not of these people. And it's pretty well not here. It's here. We. <laughs> Peter is saying there's a new day. And it's time to get on the train and go. Because time is running out. Time is short. And your life is going to go by like that. So, Father, I pray that a sermon that Peter preached like this would have as much transitional change, transformation, impact, apocalyptic in this room, in our hearts, in our families, in our minds, that we, by the power of your spirit, would start to get freed up to do things maybe we never even imagined because we already disqualified ourselves, because we said we're too young or the wrong gender. We've made too many mistakes. We've disqualified ourselves in our own brains. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would rewire that narrative right now. 
Some of you think you're too young. Some of you think you're too old. Some of you think you've made too many mistakes. Some of you, and God's going, no, no, no. I need you because today is a new day to turn it all around. And I'll give you the power to make impact like you never even dreamed of. You've stopped dreaming dreams. You've stopped prophesying. You've stopped having visions. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give them to us again and that we'd act on them, that we would treasure you, Jesus, above all things. Do that movement among us as a church for your glory and the good of people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hey guys, Pastor Mark here, one of the senior pastors around here. So glad that you are actually part of Bayside Online. You really are part of our family. We have grown uh, over the last couple of years online a ton, and we really do consider you as part of our church family. So what that means is make sure you subscribe and share this, it's great. Uh, but also get in a community group, start watching the Bible study, start being engaged, even give. Uh, one of the ways that we can actually do online church and have this global community and even do the ministry of our campuses is by people partnering with us in the gospel, as Paul talks about in Philippians chapter one. And that means by your resources, financially, there are people all over the world getting blessed through what we do at Bayside. And so obviously part of that is giving and using and stewarding that for the glory of God. So we super thankful if you do that. We'd love you to start doing that and just super thankful you're part of our church. So glad you're with us. Make sure that you let us know you're watching and part of this because we want to get in touch with you and thank you and serve you any way we can. Anyway, thanks guys and we will see you next week.